So please join me in welcoming Milo Stalik and Errol Morris to the stage. So Errol, welcome. Uh, we first need to talk about the ashtray. <laughs> um, the ashtray concerns at the center of it is a character, kind of a villain, named Thomas Kuhn, um, philosopher, historian of science. Tell us who Thomas Kuhn was. Uh, he's famous for a book published in 1962, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. But most people never read the book. <laughs> um, so what he's really famous for is a number of phrases that have wormed their, their way into our consciousness. Paradigms and paradigm shifts. That's his terminology. And to a lesser extent, incommensurability. But if you look at Google's Ngram, are you all familiar with that? <laughs> yes, no. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, when Google digitized all of the published material in the world, or at least a hefty chunk of it, uh, they provided uh, resources where you could go through published material and find out when phrases appeared in the language. So for example, if you look for paradigm shift, you can't find it before Kuhn's book appeared in 1962, and then it's all over the place. It's okay. like kudzu. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but why is, was this whole idea of the paradigm shift so important and so important to you? I think it gave really stupid people something to think about. <laughs> so, so, you were a student of Kuhn at, in, at Princeton? Oh, you I, went to his lectures? I was a student uh, at Princeton, yes, of his. Of his, and, and, yes. then, and then there was a famous incident, which of course brings us back to the book or incident that was famous to you? Pretty famous to me. Um, <laughs> uh, he was on sabbatical the second part of that year and was writing a book actually on early quantum theory and was at the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, and I always think of the Institute of Advanced Study as being kind of a center of higher learning. Uh, John von Neumann, Albert Einstein. We talk about Kuhn's office being a few doors down from the Einstein office, Einstein's office, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and we never really got along. In fact, we got along very, very badly, <laughs> which is more like saying we didn't get along. But he irritated you? I mean, I, and you describe him as a chain smoker and obviously an egotist to some extent. Um, the philosophy irritated me. Okay. Um, we live in a very strange era at the moment. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people have trouble really adjusting to what they might consider to be a new climate, um, uh, where the whole notion of truth, of what is true, what is false, has come under attack. Um, someone asked me not so long ago, um, do I feel that we've lost truth? And there's a very simple answer to it. No, of course we haven't lost truth. Truth remains the same as it always was. 
except that people are now more than ever interested in denying it. Um, you couldn't really deny it with such force if there really was no such thing. So the arguments between me and Kuhn were about his idea that there was no such thing as truth. You might even go so far as to say there's no such thing as the real world, hence the, the title of the man who denied reality. Um, I was always fascinated by this writer, Robert Musil, who wrote a book, The Man Without Qualities. And his protagonist, Ulrich, is asked what his goal is, and he said, oh, quite simply, my goal is to abolish reality. Easier said than done. Because reality has a way of persisting out there. Um, it was there before there was Homo sapiens, and probably there before there was even life on Earth. And there will probably be there even after all of life on Earth is extinguished, say in the next five years or so. <laughs> so we disagree. Um, but the disagreement was violent. Um, Not on your part. <laughs> Maybe on my part. I mean, I can be really, really annoying. I mean, I think it's one of the things I'm good at, is annoying people. Uh, you know, it's a gift, <laughs> properly considered. Um, Kuhn threw an ashtray at me um, at the Institute for Advanced Study, which I thought, it was kind of cool. <laughs> um, and he threw me out of Princeton, um, which at the time was devastating. It was really, truly devastating. Because I had no idea really what I was doing with myself. I was in my early 20s. And you were studying philosophy and history of science? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I can admit to it. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, what was I going to do with myself? Really, all I ever have wanted to do is to be able to sit somewhere and read and write. And then it kind of morphed into making a movie now and then again. But I wanted to be able to think to the extent that I I can think, I'd like to be able to think. Uh, so this was devastating at the time. And for years I had trouble writing because of all of this. Um, I'm often asked why I became a documentary filmmaker. And I don't think it was a choice. It was the only option open to me because in those days, I couldn't write anything. Uh, well, we're very lucky then. We should, then we actually owe something to Thomas Kuhn, no? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I was able to find a way to just carry on. So this idea for the book, The Ashtray, could be a revenge story? I mean, well, how did you come, come to this so many years later? Well, I have a saying that gives me some comfort, certainly appeals to me, that the best way of living well is getting revenge. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, what is all of this stuff about? Uh, you know, don't get revenge. Revenge, hate will just eat you up inside. Um, well, I would beg to differ. I, <laughs> I, I, um, um, I, I find hate, the thought of revenge, invigorating. 
<laughs> and motivating. <laughs> Well, but the, this, this truth, this search for the truth, really remained kind of your life's quest through your films. In part, yes. Um, I had the good fortune to stumble on a case in Texas, which eventually became the Thin Blue Line. And this doesn't happen every day, where you start interviewing people who have been on death row. This was in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, you hear all kinds of stories on death row. And you're told, of course, people are going to claim, I didn't do it, I wasn't there, I'm innocent, blah, 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 blah. You're told, no, 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 don't listen to any of that stuff. It's all false. But there was this one interview that I did um, at a prison in Texas, Elstree Unit, and the guy said he didn't do it. I had no idea what he was talking about. None. Didn't know anything about the case. He was just another inmate that I was putting in front of my camera. And as I learned more and more about the case, I suddenly realized, oh my God, I think he's telling me the truth. And that was the beginning of three years, close to three years of investigation um, and in the end, I was able to, to the extent you can ever absolutely prove this kind of thing, uh, I was able to prove that he, in fact, had been telling me the truth, that he was innocent, and that the chief prosecution witness against him at his trial was the real killer. So, and the man was ultimately liberated. I mean, so this is a film that actually led, led, had a, a real effect in the real world. It did everything a documentary film is supposed to do, um, except win an Academy Award. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, it was rejected. On the basis of what? Uh, that it was not r really the way one should go about making a documentary. Oh, okay. It represented a kind of documentary no-no. Mm -hmm. You know you're not supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking? Shame, shame, shame. Um, it was shown to Academy voters and they turned it off within the first five minutes, they didn't like anything about it. They didn't like what they call the reenactments in the movie. They hated the Philip Glass score, <laughs> which Philip Glass thinks is one of the best things he's ever done, and he's absolutely right. Thank you, Philip. Um, but I think it's part of who I am. It's the contrarian, uh, the heretic. Well, you said about making documentaries that, that you wanted to use any and every technique possible to really get at the substance of the truth. So whatever would work, these interviews, reconstructions, the interotron that you invented, talk about that a little bit. The interotron? The interotron, yeah. Um, it occurred to me, this seems so simple, so obvious, that there's no correct way to pursue the truth. There's the truth. And anything and everything that you can possibly do in order to pursue it is available to you. 
that allows you to go more deeply into a story, to think about a story, to turn the evidence over and over and over in your mind, to try to weigh the various elements and to try to come to a conclusion about what really happened. There was this crazy idea, call it the direct cinema or cinema verite idea, that if you just have a handheld camera and available light, that that's truth. Well, sorry. It's a handheld camera and available light. So fucking what? <laughs> And for years, I've battled this. It really does, you know, can I be perfectly honest here? It annoys me. <laughs> How would you ever think that that's what truth is? Truth is a quest, it's a pursuit. Um, you're looking uh, at things and trying to find out what really happened what was really out there in the world. Um, and anything less is unacceptable. So for example, I just made a series, I guess it's for television, I don't know what it is, but it's a six part series that was done for Netflix called, let me see that I get the name correct. <laughs> <laughs> called Wormwood. Has someone seen it here? <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it's always wanting to push the envelope. Um, when I sold Wormwood to Netflix, I described it to them as the everything bagel. <laughs> um, and it is the everything bagel. I think that's correct. Uh, I said, you're going to have reenactments, you're going to have straight drama, you're going to have interviews, you're going to have archival material, and on and on and on and on. Anything that you could imagine goes into the hopper. Um, and it's something I'm very, very proud of. I guess it's a further extension of playing with this form, pushing it, stretching it, modifying it, changing it uh, by whatever means imaginable. One of the things in the book, let's go back to the book for a second. Are we, we promoting a book here? Is that, is that? Yes, we are, because it's a fascinating book. If you read it, you'll be reading it for a long time because the best thing I've ever done. It is the best thing that Errol's ever done. <laughs> and it's beautiful. Um, but language, the whole, the whole. I told someone that it was lavishly illustrated. By the way, I went to Google because I was interested looking at the engram for lavishly illustrated. <laughs> you know, where, did that, where did that come out? Um, and, uh, and yes, when it became possible to incorporate photographs in written material, suddenly they became lavishly illustrated. So you can put it on your coffee table or you can read it. <laughs> and, it's not, and then they're not mutually exclusive. Here's my advice to everyone here. Don't read it, look at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> they have footnotes and the footnotes are fascinating. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's an odd book. And having now, this, I guess it's my fourth or fifth book, I lose count. Um, I think it's something that I'd like to continue. Just like I want to make more everything bagel movies or series, whatever you want to call them. I think of this as an everything bagel book because it does something different than I've seen in any other book. I think I can make this claim. Mm -hmm. Part memoir, part philosophy, mm -hmm. part history. Um, 
full of facts that you'll never chance upon any place else. Well, give me an example. <laughs> well, I like, for example, your Alice in Wonderland story that you have in there. Do you remember this? You quote, you say that you quote the Alice in Wonderland argument, and I, have a quote, I wrote this quote down from it. It says, the white queen presents a problem to Alice. Can you do addition? What's one and one and one and one? I don't know, said Alice. I lost count. And then you say... Not quite right. The question is, what's one and 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 one? Oh, okay. And Alice then says, I don't know, I lost count. Yes, spoil the joke. <laughs> well, but you continue, you say, does someone have to tell Alice the answer is 10? And what if the community agrees the answer is 11? And then you go back to Thomas Kuhn, and you say, in Kuhn's parlance, as expressed to Cavell, Stanley Cavell, the white queen could instruct Alice that the answer is 11 and get her to agree. And then you say, or recall Winston Smith in 1984, who wonders whether the state could effectively agree that two plus two equals four. I thought that this anecdote or episode was really actually interesting because in some ways it reflects the state of our time. It does indeed. Um, what if the state should instruct you that two plus two equals five? Um, could the state actually get away with such a thing? Well, in 1984, um, the protagonist, Winston Smith, has a fear of rats. I kind of don't like rats very much myself, <laughs> so I understand his fear. And when they start to clamp a cage on his face with rats that haven't been fed uh, in a considerable period of time. Winston Smith starts to believe that perhaps two plus two does equal five. Um, what bothered me so much about Kuhn and I suppose also about Wittgenstein. If I haven't mentioned it, I hate Wittgenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Never knew the man. So there's really no personal animosity here. He never threw anything at me. <laughs> um, but the idea that somehow that truth doesn't stand beyond us, apart from us, independent of us, um, I find troublesome. I suppose another way to say it is I don't believe it and I don't like it. Um, I sometimes imagine um, what the value of pi was in the Cambrian when there were only trilobites scuttling about. Um, my, my belief Try not to get angry with me. My belief is that pi was still pi. Maybe none of the trilobites scuttling around knew the value of pi, but that didn't mean that pi had no value. These are very simple kinds of things, but they're things which have infected the way that we see the world today. Um, is truth something that just is a matter of consensus, public agreement, um, government edict? Um, or is there something more at stake here? I mean, I don't really know how many people were at Donald Trump's inauguration. Um, what's so fascinating about this current administration is the desire to deny stuff, to deny stuff that's almost obvious. 
and to do it again and again and again and again and again. And the scariest thing, scariest thing is not denying truth, but living in a world where truth doesn't even matter anymore, mm -hmm. where people don't care. You devalue it through denying it. It goes beyond devaluing it. You ignore it. Um, it no longer becomes a factor in discourse. Um, and to me, I mean, I think the human deal, whatever it is, a pretty tawdry enterprise at best. <laughs> um, but I think one of the things that gives us dignity as a species, that's assuming that we have any dignity as a species, is the search for truth. To me, it's, it's the highest calling. And to devalue it is to devalue all of us. So yes, I wrote the book. <laughs> so, can I read? I, I read. I, I, um, it's an odd book. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, profusely illustrated, lavishly. Lavishly illustrated. <laughs> um, I have my list of characters at the end with definitions. But one of them is, is Ludwig Wittgenstein. Oh dear. Um, a notorious book, The Jew of Linz, by Kimberly Cornish, reprints a picture of students at the real school in Linz, Austria, at the beginning of the 20th century. The picture is said to include two famous, or if you prefer, infamous figures, Ludwig Wittgenstein and Adolf Hitler. That's an amazing picture. Oh, it's a, it's, now, um, we, there are arguments about whether or not it's conceded that Hitler's in the picture, is Wittgenstein in the picture. We're not altogether sure, but we are sure that they were both at that school at the same time. So the picture is said to include two famous, or if you prefer, infamous figures, Ludwig Wittgenstein and Adolf Hitler. Is it really them? Arguments have gone back and forth. Well, I, I must have written this, and I don't know. <laughs> but they were both enrolled at the real school around the same time, circa 1903. I often ask the seemingly rhetorical question when showing people the photograph. Which of these two did the greater damage in the 20th century? <laughs> okay, okay, it was Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the damage that you think Wittgenstein caused? The damage to truth. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So in your own quest for the truth, you... I, there's, there's this really wonderful obituary that was written for Wittgenstein by Bertrand Russell. <laughs> Bertrand Russell being one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. And uh, love the guy. So... Lived to a good old age. He, um, he wrote in the biography that he couldn't really decide at first whether Wittgenstein was a colossal genius or a fool. <laughs> and he cites an example and the example is an argument they had about existential propositions. In this particular case, they were standing in a lecture hall. Is there a rhinoceros in the hall? And Russell said, looking around, <laughs> uh, no rhinoceros, I'm sorry. Walked around, opened some closets, looked under a couple of desks. No rhinoceros. And um, Wittgenstein said, no, you can't make that claim. And it occurred to me reading this that Donald Rumsfeld would have just loved this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. <laughs> One of the more repulsive sentiments that I've ever heard. But do you want me to talk about Donald Rumsfeld? Talk, well, talk about him and McNamara both, because those were your two political figures, right, in your films that you took on. The only person that I've extensively interviewed, I made this movie, The Unknown Known, um, with Donald Rumsfeld. And it's a movie I rather like. People could never quite understand that it was an art film. It wasn't my attempt to play gotcha journalism with Rumsfeld, which might have been more satisfying to an audience, I don't know. It would have been less satisfying to me. But we kept going back again and again to this absence of evidence as an evidence of absence. In one of his snowflakes, these endless series of memos that he wrote and sent around, he actually s sent this to George W. Bush. And I just imagine this guy looking at this snowflake. <laughs> absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. So I tried to track it down. Where in hell did this expression come from? Who came up with this? And actually, it came out of a fairly respectable group of scientists who were searching for extraterrestrial life. Martin Rees and Carl Sagan. Okay? So, you search the universe. The universe is a pretty big place. You see no evidence of extraterrestrial life, but there's certain calculations you make about the size of the universe, the number of stars, the number of planets, and on and on and on and on and on. And you sort of think, well, you know, there just well might be intelligent life out there somewhere. Um, you know, my question has always been as whether there's intelligent life here, but that's <laughs> a different issue. <laughs> but I called Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royale, um, and said that the expression had bothered me, and he said, well, why? why, why what, what's the problem here? And I said, because it seems to be about boundary conditions. It seems to be about size. So, for example, if I'm talking about the universe, the universe is a big place. Correct me if I'm wrong, I assume it's pretty big. <laughs> it's bigger than me. So it must be really big. And so, yeah, maybe absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. But what happens going back to Russell's obituary for mm -hmm. Wittgenstein, mm -hmm. You're in someone's bedroom, and they say to you, there's no rhinoceros in my bedroom. And you say, well, you know, absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. And you say, basically, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And I looked around the bedroom, and no rhinoceros. So here's my question to you. You can think about it. Whether or not this kind of statement makes sense depends on how big an area you're talking about. If you're talking about the universe, okay. If you're talking about your closet, not okay. Here's the question I want you to think about and answer. Is Iraq closer in size to your bedroom or to the universe? <laughs> so when you were in, when you 
<laughs> so when you spent all this time with Rumsfeld, did he irritate you? Were you tempted to throw an ashtray at him? No. No. I found him really, really frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll never know. I don't think I can even answer this question for myself. Um, there's something really self-satisfied and really glib um, about Donald Rumsfeld. I made a movie, previous movie, about Robert S. McNamara, and there was nothing self-satisfied or glib about McNamara mm -hmm. at all. Um, they're just very different kinds of people. And it was partially summed up, and maybe it's a stupid question that you ask people, but I asked it anyway. He's there in the Oval Office. This would be Donald Rumsfeld. He's there in the Oval Office with President Ford, Henry Kissinger, kind of various figures from the Ford administration, and we're pulling out of Vietnam. The people are cl climbing on the helicopters at the American Embassy in Saigon, pushing uh, planes off of the various aircraft carriers. Uh, it, it could be considered the end of one of the worst debacles in American history. Um, certainly for me, because I'm part of that generation that lived through Vietnam and was appalled by it appalled by it then, still appalled by it now. You were in Madison at the time. I was in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. And um, Dick Cheney was in married student housing on the other side of the lake. Um, I think with very different political sensibilities from my own. <laughs> Don't know for sure, but I, it's my hunch. Um, and uh, I asked. Donald Rumsfeld, what did you learn? What did you learn from this? And he said, well, some things work out, some things don't. That didn't. Hmm. <laughs> Profound. I found it, just speaking for myself, less than satisfying. memory serves me correctly, a lot of people died in that war. You know? 58,000 Americans, millions and millions of people in Southeast Asia. So I don't know. There's a great mystery about... I guess there's a great mystery about evil. I'm not sure I believe in evil. Although I do believe that people do really, really bad things. Is it because they themselves are evil? Um, through my career, I've interviewed mass murderers, um, psychos of every description, um, political figures. Um, Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Maybe someone here can explain this to me. It's another great mystery. When Stephen Hawking died, not so long ago, which was, for me, really, really a sad event because I truly love the guy. Mm -hmm. you, you don't meet someone like him every day. Um, really funny really perverse. Um, and incredibly smart. And when the obituaries came out, he was on the front page of the New York Times, mm -hmm. 
But the Wall Street Journal buried him. I get three papers in the morning. I get the real deal. Discount <laughs> for, for all three. I get the Boston Globe, I get the Journal, and I get the Times. And um, I can't even imagine not getting them. I wake up in the morning, I go out, the papers are out on, uh, on the front sidewalk. But the journal buried Hawking on page four, a smallish mm -hmm. article. And I could never figure out why they do that. Is it his left-wing politics? I suppose I should have called someone and asked. Not that I would get <laughs> necessarily answer. a truthful <laughs> answer. So we have some audience questions uh, from Brooks Sterrett. And the question is, in an interview, you refer to your film, The Thin Blue Line, as, on one level, quote, an essay on false history. How do you conceive of the relation between a visual form such as film and a form existing solely as text, such as a nonfiction book, essay, or novel? Um, first of all, truth really isn't a visual thing. Photographs are neither true nor false. They have no truth value. I'm terribly sorry, photographs. Um, and I love photographs. You have a lot of photographs in your book. <laughs> <laughs> Lavishly illustrated. <laughs> yeah, um, but they have no truth value. Truth value c comes from sentences, from language. Language held up against the world. Um, but if you think about it for a moment, um, it doesn't matter whether we're dealing with documentaries or we're dealing with fiction films. If they're saying something about the world, about history, whatever, then it does have truth value. You know, you can look at a film that purports to be about Dunkirk, and you can ask certain questions. Does this reflect what happened at Dunkirk? Um, uh, or does it fail to reflect what happened? Or what parts of the film reflect what happened at Dunkirk? You can think about it, which I often do. I mean, one of the, the exercises that I love doing is to look at a film that has this connection with the real world and to think about whether it's an accurate depiction or not, and in what respect is it accurate or not. Um, there's a very simple question you can ask about the Thin Blue Line. This involved the murder of a Dallas police officer on a very lonely, <laughs> dark road in West Dallas, mostly deserted road. Um, two cops pull out of a Burger King and see a car traveling uh, without headlights. So they pull the car over a routine traffic stop. Um, the partner of the policewoman we believe stays in the car and never gets out of the car until after the shooting. Robert Wood, her partner, does get out, walks up to the driver's side of the vehicle and is shot five times and killed. Car speeds off into the night. Okay? There's a question you can ask. Uh, lots of questions you could ask. You know, did Randall Adams, who was convicted of the crime and who came within two days of a date with old Sparky, the Texas electric chair, was he the driver? Was he there? And these questions, on some very basic level, have true and false answers. May not be the easiest thing in the world to establish 
what the correct answer is. But we know that there's a fact of the matter. We know there's a real world out there in which things happen. It's not up for grabs. Excuse me, Mr. Wittgenstein. Um, there's real bullets in a real gun that killed this police officer. Um, and that unassailable reality is something that has endlessly fascinated me. And there are two sides to it, or at least in my overly simplified brain. One is what really happened and to what extent are we willing to try to deny what really happened or avoid figuring out what really happened. I suppose history for me often is is the denial of history. The almost endless lengths we go to to efface history, to cover up history, to avoid history, to apologize for history and deny it. Deny and rewrite? De deny and rewrite history? R rewrite almost inevitably. Yeah. And uh, Napoleon on St. Helena where he was exiled in the last years of his life, gave this elaborate dictation. I hope it will be the subject of a movie. Um, elaborate dictation to his various aides who accompanied him to this island in the South Atlantic. Um, his attempt to actually rewrite his own history what went wrong? What really did happen? What mistakes did I make? Uh, what could I have done otherwise? Um, and he said to one of his scribes, after all, isn't history just an agreed upon fiction? Um, well, excuse me, Mr. Napoleon. <laughs> Um, I don't think history is an agreed upon fiction. We may have terrible difficulties of trying to get back to history and figuring out history and what happened in our past, but it's not just up for grabs. It's something to be pursued, something to be investigated, something to be thought about. I mean, we live at a time, it's really interesting, um, at the is heart- that a, Is that a moral responsibility? I think it is a moral yeah. responsibility. Um, part of the responsibility of being alive. Um, in Wormwood, at the heart of this, this involves the murder of, a, of an army bioweapon scientist, Frank Olson, who I believe was murdered by the CIA. And this goes back to 1953. Well, what was happening in 1953? We don't really think about it very much anymore, but we had just supposedly resolved the Korean War, one of the bloodiest wars in our history. And then a war which I would respectfully submit to all of you is still very much ongoing in so many, 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 many ways. Um, if we're not here in five months from now, maybe it will involve Korea. <laughs> um, a war bloodier than Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of the use of napalm, mm -hmm. both in World War II, McNamara was involved in the firebombing of Japan, and even in my movie, Fog of War, it's one of the most extraordinary things that I've heard as a filmmaker said, um, our side won or I would be tried as a war criminal. The extensive use of napalm in, in the Japanese theater in World War II, extensive use of napalm in Vietnam, but the most extensive use of all was in Korea. Which is a part of the North Korean memory. It's part of their history. Yeah. 
So a question from uh, Dave Tolchinsky. Was that too long an answer? If no, so, it was yeah. a great answer. You covered <laughs> a lot of ground. <laughs> sure, you've been asked this before, but what has been the most rewarding aspect of being a filmmaker, the most difficult, and the most surprising? Um, well, I love making films. I try to deny it from time to time. But I actually do love doing it. Which part do you like? I, I, I often say that the reason that I make films is so I can make another film. If I've made a film that's kind of sort of OK, chances are much greater that someone is going to give me money to do yet another. Um, and I love, uh, I love the idea of experimenting with film. I mean, I often think of Hollywood, um, self-serving of me to say this, but I'm saying it so it should be self-serving. Um, <laughs> I often think of Hollywood movies as painting by number. Uh, that they're formulaic, they do the same things more or less in the same way. Um, and what I do, for better or for worse, is experimental. I get an opportunity to reinvent the form every time I sit down and I make a movie. And that's great. So thank you. Whoever has made this possible, thank you. <laughs> and the most challenging? Uh, they're all challenging. They're all underfunded. Um, hard to make, mm. uh, frightening, um, but immensely satisfying. So yeah, I think I'll continue for a while. Well, what's amazing is since Gates of Heaven, for which Werner Herzog had to eat his shoe, First of all, he didn't have to eat his shoe. Well, he wanted to. And of course he wanted to. <laughs> um, I've known Werner Herzog for 40 plus years. And there's one thing that I know about Werner Herzog is he never, never misses an opportunity for self-promotion. <laughs> um, uh, I, I reminded him not so long ago that the, uh, the bet had been seriously misconstrued by him and others. The bet was not that he would eat his shoe. The bet was that he would eat his foot. <laughs> and I'm still waiting to collect. <laughs> I mean, what's amazing is, is that, you know, you've, you have a really significant body of work. I mean, between... Had that happen. I don't know. <laughs> You've just been at it. You've been this, it's that search for the truth. Yeah, you do this long enough, and evidently, it's this pile of detritus accumulates underneath you. So thank you, Errol Morris. Please see him in the lobby afterwards. Thank Assign you very much. Ashtray, lavishly illustrated. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Is this okay? Yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs>